because I, th- I, th- I think as you read through the books of the Bible, it's pretty clear that the authors were like actually meant what they believed. And it wasn't just a metaphor for something else. You know, if you look at particularly the New Testament, these are letters by church leaders to churches trying to speak into these churches situations where maybe they've got lots of problems going on and saying, no, no, this is what we believe about Jesus and the, the like what it means for us and, and what that like cashes out as spiritual realities. You know, it's not just it is spiritual, but it transform it, but it is real. And then in light of that, what that meant for those churches at that time. Um, so that would be, you know, kind of a lot of the New Testament stuff, the gospels, so the historical accounts of the life of Jesus that are collected in the Bible. You know, the authors very clearly believed this was true. Um, you know, they write down names of people, places they were. Um, when you compare it to some of the gospels that weren't included in the Bible, those ones that weren't included in the Bible had like very few names and very few places, which means it's more likely it was made up at a later time somewhere else. Um, whereas those ones which are included, they actually you know bear the marks of something that was written at the time. Um, and then it looks like they're writing to persuade people it was true. So we can at least say that the authors believe that what they were writing was actually true and wasn't a metaphor for something else. And I, I think that holds for the for the um, Old Testament part of the Bible as well, although the specific way in which it cashes out will be different. So then the question would be, do you find it persuasive? <laughs> you know, do, you, do you actually agree with with uh, with what they're saying? And, and, you know, if you're coming from a place of saying, well, you know, there's absolutely nothing s- supernatural or spiritual about the world, then, you know, you've already written it off and you can't believe that these things are true. You can believe maybe they believed it was true, although you probably have some challenges. Like, why do they believe these, you know, accounts of, you know, large-scale public miracles are true? Um, that's quite hard to explain. But actually, you know, if, if perhaps you have a more open mind and say, well, you know what, actually, you know, I'm not, you know, just going to commit to there being a, a spiritual reality, but I'm, I'm open to the idea that there might be, then actually it shifts the probabilities a lot. And actually, you know, you can look at some of the some of those, for example, you know, large scale public miracles that Jesus, you know, that the, the Bible claims Jesus did and say, well, actually, you know, if they're writing to persuade people and it was written, you know, around the time, so people would have been around who saw this kind of stuff. If it didn't happen, then that's like the worst persuasion technique ever. But uh, but. You know, if, if there are these spiritual... Re- I mean, take, for example, the end of Matthew's Gospel. Some people think it's the earliest Gospel that was written. Most modern scholars don't, but throughout history, a lot of people have. Um, it was written by one of Jesus's, uh, you know, first followers, one of the leaders in the church. And, you know, depending on where you date it, some sceptical scholars date it, you know, um, you know, second century, you know. But, you know, I, I do think that sometimes their scepticism isn't warranted. <laughs> Um, and not just because, you know, I'm biased because I'm a believer, I just, I just don't think it's that warranted. And at the end, Jesus was buried, there was a tomb, and there were guards put in front of the tomb because they knew the disciples, well, they knew that they thought the disciples would come and steal the body. And it says this, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed, and the story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Now, notice what Matthew's doing there is he's responding to an objection That was circulated at the time. Now, the objection wasn't the body still there in the tomb. The objection was the disciples stole the body, which means it was predicated on the idea that the tomb was empty. So everyone agrees the tomb was empty. So the question is, did the disciples come and steal the body? Now, let's be real. That's the dumbest idea anyone's come up with to try and start a religion. Like, you've got this tomb guarded by Roman soldiers and you're going to try and take him down. <laughs> like, and you're not a soldier. Like, I don't know about you, but like, you know, I'm a five foot ten skinny guy. That's not going to be my plan. 
the idea that the soldiers were asleep is like a really silly idea as well, because, you know, they, they would have gotten so much trouble. Um, and they, you know, why, if the disciples stole it, why didn't they say the disciples stole the body, you know? So all in all, it seems like a bit of a, a rubbish kind of explanation to say the disciples stole the body. But then, you know, the tomb's empty. And there's not really any other good explanation other than it actually happened. Um, which, as we've said, if you if your mind's closed off to a resurrection, you can't believe that. But if you're open-minded to the possibility that it might, then all of a sudden it becomes a lot more plausible. If Jesus really did rose from the dead, then we have to take that very seriously. Why is it that this one person has come back to life from the dead? Because most people don't. <laughs> you know, I don't think I'm winning any awards for that observation. But, but why is it that it was Jesus? And then at that point, we have to take his teaching seriously and listen to it and wonder, is God endorsing what this man is saying? And, and I think, you know, without going into lots of detail, that's how we can get from the Bible is just a historical text to the Bible is a divinely inspired text.